In verse 20 of chapter 15, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To fall asleep was a euphemism to mean you're dead. It's like today we say he passed away rather than saying he croaked or he died. Well, when are the rest going to be raised? Paul answers that three verses later. Each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who belong to Christ at his coming. And elsewhere, Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the concept Paul has in mind here is when, you, when a, a believer dies, they're, they're buried, their body remains buried, but their spirit goes to be with Jesus in heaven. And then when Jesus returns, he brings them back with him. And then everybody else who's alive at that time is raised. This is kind of illustrated in another of Paul's undisputed letters, perhaps the first one that he wrote, probably the earliest letter we have in our New Testament. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So God is going to bring back with him the spirits of those who were followers of Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So if he's bringing back the spirits of believers with him, then who are the dead in Christ who are being raised? Well, that has to be referred to the corpses of those who have died. So the spirit is returned to the body, which is then brought back to life and then transformed into this immortal, glorious, powerful resurrection body. And so what Paul and the early Christians have in mind by resurrection, it's a physical bodily event. It occurs to the corpse, which is then transformed. Now, this could be said a little more succinctly by going to Romans 8, 11, and Paul says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, also give life to your mortal body. He gave life to Jesus' mortal body. He will give life to your mortal bodies. And then toward the end of that chapter, referring to um, when all of creation is redeemed when Christ returns, including the redemption of our bodies. So again, resurrection is a physical bodily event. It happens to the corpse. This is what they believed. The first thing to note is that Dr. Lycona has taken those two Romans verses way out of context because Paul's main point is how the Christian should walk in the spirit, that is, in obedience to God, as opposed to walking in the flesh, that is, in disobedience to God. So that the Christian goal is to attain to the resurrection and become like Christ himself. As 1 John 3, 2 says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So there's nothing here in Romans 8 or anywhere else in scripture for that matter about going to heaven as a disembodied soul and when Christ returns at the resurrection is to reconnect you with a new glorified body. Also, note Paul's use of parallelism throughout Romans 8, when he uses the word body as equivalent to you, yourself. In verse 23, Paul writes, we ourselves, that is, the redemption of our bodies. This shows that for Paul, the word body describes man as a whole, not a part which may be detached from the true I, according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. The word biblical commentary adds that Paul would probably not think it necessary to remind his audience that he was thinking in Hebraic terms of the human body as that dimension of the person whereby his environment, both material and social, is experienced. So here, even when Paul focuses on mortal body, Paul's point is precisely that the life-giving work of the Spirit will finally embrace that too. Salvation will be completed, not by escape from the body, but by redemption of the body, according to Romans 8, verse 23. It's equally important to see that for Paul, human 
bodiliness forms an unbroken continuum of which the person's physicality is an integral part, quote, mortal body, dead body. Of this, Christ's own resurrection from the dead has provided both the pattern and the assurance. See Romans 6, verses 7 to 10. So it's no surprise to find this warning from Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 28, when he says that there's only one person you should fear, the one who can destroy both your soul and body in Gehenna, that is the lake of fire. Let's also remember that Jesus was brought up well versed in the Old Testament teaching that by the word soul, the Hebrew nephesh, the Bible means the whole self, the whole person, the whole individual. This teaching goes back all the way to the Genesis creation when God breathed life into the dirt or clay that would become the first Adam in Genesis 2 verse 7. After God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, the man, that is Adam, became a living person, literally a living soul, with the Hebrew word there, nephesh. Hence, Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 28, probably has this Old Testament warning in mind from Ezekiel 18, when God says that the soul who sins is the one who will die. This explains why Jesus later says to his apostles in places like John chapter 8 and 13, where I am going, you cannot come. In the book, The God of the Gospel of John, Dr. Marian Thompson adds, the assumption that John dispenses with a literal future resurrection of the dead would mean that he has significantly altered the view of resurrection found elsewhere in the documents of the New Testament or in the Judaism of the period. Dr. Thompson adds that John has not collapsed the future resurrection into a present quality of life, even a divinely given life, such as the one Paul described in Romans 8. She says that language of being raised up remains resolutely attached to the future, to the last day, thus bringing to fruition what the Father offers through the Son the gift of life. These same biblical principles of exegesis should apply to other writings from Paul that are sometimes lifted out of its broader mainstream Jewish view concerning death. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes what a terrible and painful thing death is by describing it as the sting of death and how one day this terrible thing will be swallowed up via the resurrection. But the normative biblical view has itself been swallowed up by the infusion of Gnostic, philosophical, and early pagan ideas, many of which come from the earliest Christian sources, like the so-called Church Fathers, Tertullian writing around the second century, we define the soul as born of the breath of God, immortal. And Gregory of Nyssa, writing in the fourth century, admits that pagan philosophy says that the soul is immortal. This is a pious, that is good offspring or teaching. That the Bible teaches a resurrection of the body only is clearly a denial of Jesus' one and only resurrection from the dead as a whole person one whole soul, a nephesh, because if the whole person of Christ has not been raised, our message, says Paul, has no meaning and your faith also has no meaning. In other words, you Christian are still dead in your sins and we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that cannot be true if there is no resurrection of the dead, in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. As an appendix to this, I noted that the expositor's commentary says that some translate or interpret Romans 8 verse 10 as if Paul said, your body is dead, but your spirit remains alive. 
But then the commentary says, on the other hand, able commentators in increasing numbers are coming to a different conclusion. One is the unlikelihood that in a passage that has consistently referred to Penefma, the spirit, in terms of the spirit of God, the word would be given a different frame of reference in, in this one instance. To be sure, the use of the word body over against the word spirit might seem to be sufficient ground for assuming that Paul is talking about two contrasting elements of the human constitution. But where such a sharp contrast is congenial to Greek thought, it is alien to the Hebraic concept of life that characterizes both Testaments. In fact, it has been recognized that in Paul's usage, the word body usually means the totality of one's being. And then the commentary notes the theological dictionary of the New Testament on the word body, man as a whole, not a part which may be detached from the true I. Can we really suppose that when Paul speaks of this body of death, Romans 7 verse 24, he has reference merely to the physical organism?